um, here for morning. Morning. We'll start in a few moments, but we are now uh, live with a lot of people signing in, and uh, we just see that um, Oliver said that you've been outside doing press ups, and uh, so the, everyone that's joining us has now been either on a run or hanging from the ceiling or doing planking or whatever. So yeah. it's good. Uh, look at the people coming in. This is wonderful. Sue from uh, Daitaipu, south of Christchurch. Uh, you may know Aidan from... Uh, Queenstown, just around the corner. Oh, okay. That's good. Steve Grant from T Awanga. Uh, and Quentin from uh, McRae's. Oh, McRae's in the South Island. Great. Oh, there's some, going to be some great people here for you today, Steve. The length of New Zealand by the looks of things. Yes. It's going to be wonderful. Um, all right. Well, well look, okay, we'll Awanga, is that? I'm not sure where that is. We saw someone, someone from. might type that in and just say exactly where that is. Oh, look, we've got Wyoming. We've got Keith. worldwide audience. Welcome, Keith. Are you a Kiwi in Wyoming or are you um, a devoted uh, USA man? Just type in uh, if you. Oh, US. Welcome, Keith. And how do you, you hear about fans this? everywhere, Steve? You've got fans everywhere. How'd you hear about this webinar, Keith? I would be interested to know. Uh, it was on Fox News. <laughs> of course. <laughs> they they, they uh, are moving away from Trump and now looking for a new hero. So you could be the new hero on Fox. Imagine that. I don't want to be a politician. Uh, Steve Grant says Tiawang is right beside Kate Kidnappers. Oh, right. Cool. Nice. Oh, okay. And a breath away from the winery. <laughs> we'll, 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 get, we'll get underway. And uh, so we'll just click if you bring that up. Keith, we can talk to you about blue water sailing later. Oh, yes. You want to do a bit of that. So yeah. um, I think we better get underway. So welcome, everyone, to the Brainstorm Room. And a big welcome and thank you to Steve Gurney for being our guest today. I'm Jamie Tullock, MD of E3 Business Accountants and co-founder of the brainstorm room. Before we hand over to Steve, and you can see him bouncing up and down on the on the left-hand margin here, I'd like to tell you about the brainstorm room. The brainstorm room was born during COVID-19 level four lockdown. During a Zoom brainstorming session about how to best support our business owning clients who needed all the help, support, and guidance they could get to survive and then thrive, William Miller, who's an ideas man here at E3, and I had a startling thought. Uh, can we gather together a team of voluntary experts who will offer Kiwi business owners free access to their knowledge, skills, and experience to help them survive and thrive? So William and I contacted a number of professionals and business advisors and successful entrepreneurs to ask if they would support such an initiative. The feedback was overwhelmingly positive, and so the Brainstorm Room was born. The mission of the Brainstorm Room is to give every Kiwi business owner a fighting chance to survive and thrive. We believe that every business owner, every business should be enjoyable, profitable and sustainable. Now, a little bit about the webinar. Steve will start with about a 15 minute summary of why and how preparing for and winning races translates into preparing for a successful business, even against the odds. Now, excuse me, Steve, but Steve often jokes how he was physically puny but still figured out tactics and strategies to beat the bigger and stronger athletes that he was up against. Everyone in business has bigger and stronger competitors so let's learn from Steve how to beat them. Steve was also shy and an introvert so his success in the public eye belies those apparent handicaps. And just like the America's Cup yachts which can leverage the wind speed and exceed it by four times or more, it's amazing when you think you got 10 knots of wind and you can get a yacht doing over 40 knots. Why, why does that happen? That, that's extraordinary. Steve learned how to leverage a little bit of cunningly applied energy and beat all comers. During this webinar, we'll be accepting questions that Steve will answer. Just type your question into the chat area on the right of your screen. That's over here on the right. You can see a chat box area or in the question area directly under the video image if you just scroll down a little bit. So what Steve doesn't get to answer today, he will personally respond by email within the next few days. You can choose to have your question answered live or privately later. Just say which in your question. Um, now, Steve's a great self-promoter, and although he is offering help and support to members of the Brainstorm Room, he still needs to pay the mortgage and put food on the table. 
So if your business needs a big fat dose of Steve, please engage him to motivate you, your business and team to a successful 2021. Steve will help you leave a difficult 2020 behind. Now, just a little bit about Steve for those who don't know too much about him. He won the Coast to Coast Multi-Sport Endurance event nine times, nine times. Raced mountain bikes twice at the World Champs, got an engineering degree and invented a bike with wings. Nearly died in Borneo when he got poisoned by bat dung. Yuck. And went nude on breakfast TV. Now, I think we've got a photograph or something. No, about no, no. Uh, no sorry. We, that's been banned. And then he waxed his entire body for Dancing with the Stars. And no, we don't have a photograph of that either. I think, I think the public had enough of that. Um, and then he went and broke the world record for crossing the Sahara under wind power and was awarded the MNZM Gong for Services to Endurance Sport. Steve is a trainer in the field of NLP, which is Neuro Linguistic Programming. I think I'll just stick to NLP. And is, and is self-employed as a coach, writer, and public speaker. Hey, Steve, I'm exhausted just talking about you. I'm going to hand it over to you, so it's all yours from now on. Thank you, Jamie. Hi, everybody. Welcome. So I want to start off by saying I'm not an expert in business. That's Jamie's all day. What I am an expert in is winning. Hey, Jamie, there's a big echo going on. Can you? Oh, got it. It's gone. Good. Hey, so I want to share the next 15 to 20 minutes, whatever it is, talking about the crossover I see. What what commonalities do success in sport have with other endeavors in life? And so I had a 20 year career as a, as a professional athlete, but a large part of that, I mean, it wasn't just coast to coast. It was racing all over the world in big events like the Primal Quest, the Eco Challenge, mountain biking, as Jamie said, and the coast to coast was like the New Zealand measure of my success. So what I did in that 20 years, though, I got um, totally fascinated. I was you know, pedantic about understanding what do people do in their heads to get success? Because as Jamie pointed out, I'm not physically talented. I'm a bit puny. I had to get my wins through um, attitude and, and the, the mental drive that instructed these muscles how to be, the, or how to get that leverage that Jamie talked about. So um, the study I did and the experience I got, I mean, most of my wins were on the shoulders of failure. You know, it took me five years to win the coast to coast race. So it was through all the mistakes I made that I learned. So I didn't see failure as actually failure. It was a, as failure as actually feedback, clues on how not to do it. So the, what I'm wanting to talk about today is the extremes at the end of the bell curve. You know, if you drew a bell curve, there's what most people do, but at each side of it, there's those 5% or thereabouts of, of people who are either fail really badly or succeed extremely well. And I want to talk about the people that ex succeed extremely well. What do they do that stands them apart from the bulk of people who might set a goal but never really uh, consistently achieve it? What makes these successful people consistently achieve their goals despite things like COVID, despite failures that inevitably happen in life? And that brings me up to the next uh, intro point I want to make is why have I chosen adventure racing as the metaphor? I, I, I really I think it mirrors life really well. If you want to get uh, the measure of true fitness, you go run and run around a stadium or 400 meter track and you, or a marathon, those sorts of things. And that's very repeatable, but that's not true life. Adventure racing uh, in an adventure race, which is perhaps a week long or even like coast to coast, which is one day or two days, days long. Things never, ever go to plan. And the winners are those people that are able to deal with the, the bad weather, the punctures, the mechanicals, the injuries, those things that happen as a fact, like we do in life, you know, things that go wrong in life, like COVID has 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 done to us. So that's what I talk what I want to talk about today. So I've chosen six points, and we haven't got time in in this short webinar to dive deeply into any of them. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to be sharing the, the what I consider to be the low hanging fruit, uh, and so you'll get good value from this. But if you want to know more, of course, you can ask questions later on in this webinar or. Uh, uh, email me or get me into your business um, as a consultant or you know a storyteller as a as a uh, to run a workshop. So the first point I want to talk about of those six uh, is the goals. It may seem pretty basic of a, a subject, a topic. Anyone can set goals, and you hear it every day almost. You know, someone wants to lose weight, or someone wants to get fitter, or they want to run a marathon. And uh, many, you know, the large, larger than fifty percent of those people often, you know, don't achieve that goal. Now, why is it, and what's the difference between those people who 
achieve their goal frequently and consistently. And the first point I want to make is, is that they choose a goal that is truly, truly inspirational. So in business, it's often a goal that's not truly inspirational. It's about finance and the business and that sort of stuff. And it doesn't really support what really matters intrinsically. So when I want to talk about an intrinsically motivating goal or an inspirational goal is something that gives you uh, goosebumps or makes the hairs on the back of your neck stand up if, when you visualize achieving that goal. In other words, it makes a huge difference to the world and to yourself or to your family, to your community, whatever. And and the bottom line here is with them. What's in it for me? I don't care what you say about um, giving to the community and being uh, generous and that sort of thing. We always, you know, Mother Teresa, she um, it may sound like, you know, she's the true angel, you know, but she actually must have done that, had that lifestyle, those given in the way she did, because it satisfies something within herself uh, in terms of what she's giving to the world. And so it actually does boil back to what's in it for me. So when you're setting a goal, make sure it truly ticks off all those things that you value immensely in life. Um, another way of putting this is uh, on your deathbed that you're going to have no regrets. I mean, how many times do you see the desiderata that someone's typed or someone's tra trans translated onto, into, onto the internet saying, if I had my life again, I would do things differently. And I had one of those given to me when I was on my deathbed in, uh, with that leptospirosis bat dung. I, I mean, I was this close to dying. I was unconscious on life support machines. But on the recovery uh, in, the, in the current recovery weeks, I get set, got sent lots of, lots of get well cards. I have to slow down my speaking, don't I? Lots of get well cards. And one of those had a desiderata in it like that, if I had my life again. And it made me really think, if I had died now, would I have any regrets? And it's a useful thing for you guys to do as well, is to think what I'm spending my days and time doing in business and in life, in any aspect of life, Am I using my time wisely and will I have regrets later on at the end of this phase? It might be when you retire or it might be when you become a mother or a father uh, and you have to change your occupation. Will I have any regrets that I didn't give it my best? And that's the sort of goal that makes those successful people stand out. Uh, number two is on, on the goals thing is, is it initiated, initiated by self. So are you doing your goal for your own reasons or is it because you, it's something that someone set for you as a business target, for example. And, you know, those aren't sustainable sort of goals. Whereas we see athletes who set goals that they really want to achieve themselves, to prove themselves or to gain that self-confidence. How can you set that sort of goal in your business or in other lives, parts of your life, that will make, uh, that, that that's solving something that you want solved, not some, I'll, I'll give you another example. I, I do a bit of work in schools and one of the, uh, one of the boys, young boys, set a goal. He says, um, oh, I, I want my mother to treat me better. See, that's a goal that's initiated by someone else. It, it relies on his mother's response. So we worked with him and we changed it around. He said, oh, I want to behave in such a way that I get a better relationship with my mother. So that's initiated by self. So how can you translate that into your business goals or your other physical goals or whatever goal you're setting? And the third point I want to talk about in goal setting is it's very easy to set a goal, you know, right, I've got this lofty, audacious goal and I'm here at the moment and, and people just set the goal and that's it. They don't actually take any action on how to create the steps or the pathway to get there. Or they might do, but it's not clear enough and it's too vague for our brains to understand or have instructions on how to get there. So the research shows that successful goal getters are very clear or they add a whole lot of richness on how to get between here and there. Um, for example, my coast to coast goals. Um, or actually, for example, five languages that our brains work in is visual, auditory, kinesthetic, olfactory, gustatory. So that's smell and taste. So visual is what do we see, auditory is what we hear, kinesthetic is what we physically feel. Um, so what I did when I set my goals for coast to coast, I wanted to win it. Very clear goal. And I wanted to win it by X year or X, X time. And then I say, what will I see that lets me know I have won my coast to coast? And of course, what will I see that's different to anyone else? And this is what you've got to do is what's different to anyone else and, and, and or what's what's unique to your goal? What I'll see is the finishers tape that I'm, only one person gets to break that finishing tape at the finish line. Another thing is during the race, if I'm in winning, if I'm in first place, I'll see no one in front of me. So what won't I see? So that's the visual. What will I hear that's different? 
uh, everyone gets the applause at the finish line. I'll hear the commentator on the microphone saying, here comes Steve Gurney to win. And I'll hear congratulations. And I'll hear myself saying congratulations to second, third and fourth place, which is different than if I came second or third. So what will you see and hear and feel? So you add this richness. What will you experience on your track to your goal? And what will let you know that you've got it? And this is what this, the research shows is successful goal getters add that richness so there are instructions for their unconscious mind along the way to get there it's not left as a sort of a vague gap uh so i'll move on now to number two points so first one was goals that what are, what are successful people do that's different secondly is is, is that kind of handshakes with the goal thing is are you satisfying your unique ability or are you using your unique ability there's a, a quote that says that unless you're using your unique ability or what makes you different and special then you're wasting your time on this planet so that links quite nicely to the goal setting because goals need to be supporting your purpose on the planet uh so put another way like um it's no good me trying to be a tennis player because that's not my sort of skill set i'm not good at that fast reaction squash playing tennis playing acceleration type stuff i'm an endurance athlete so it's about that's not going to be in line with my unique ability i have endurance i also love creativity so i love inventing stuff and new equipment and pods and things for for the bike you know so when you're setting these goals or when you're in business uh, is it something that stands you apart from others or are you just doing this because it seems the right thing to do what is it that you're particularly good at, or your team is particularly good at that's going to give you that competitive advantage for success uh in other words uh strengths weaknesses opportunities threat the swot analysis and uh, that's what we do in, in team events when we've got a team doing these eco challenge type things. We're uh, on the phone or on a Zoom to each other, um, checking that you know what it, what what does each of us offer in terms of strengths? Where is our weak, where are our weaknesses and who who's covering that sort of stuff, etc. I have to move on quickly here. So that's the second point. Uh, first point was goals. Second one is you can unique ability. The third one I think is quite a big one is is a champion team. So some of you may recall. Um, uh, Robbie Deans and the Crusaders a few years ago had a, a little byline that says a champion team will always beat a team of champions. So in other words, you need to work really well together. In our adventure racing, we may have athletes who no one's really heard of. They're not necessarily winners in, in other races, but because they work so cohesively as a team, they have tremendous success and they can beat a team of uh, well-performed individuals who aren't working together. Uh, Team New Zealand yachting is a, a classic example of that. So uh, there are four pillars of team success we've found in our adventure racing. And the first one is, is are your teammates aligned with your values? So there's no point if, uh, how do I say this in a quick way? Like how often do we see on the office of the wall framed at reception area you will see our company values are our mission statement is and you know management has, has, has typed this up put it on the wall and think that's going to be a magic panacea to to to, to success in the company that and on, and so often it's just a sort of a cliche thing that some you could you could easily find on a google search so what the key is is as in it's as in sport teams is i think that management needs to think about what is it our values are here what's our unique ability what 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 really matters to us with them as a team uh as a company and select the staff that align with that there's no <laughs> it's no good at um, employing people who don't align with that they'll always be there'll always be some disharmony going on and that doesn't make a champion team um so there's some very very clear research that shows people don't stay in a, in a business in a, in a workplace for the salary or the money or the wages they stay because they feel they're aligned with the company. They stay and contribute because they feel they're making a difference, that they're valued and they're listened to and appreciated. And that's the same across all teams. I'll give you an example in adventure racing. Um, so that's the first pillar, uh, values. And in adventure racing, there's other examples. There's three other pillars I want to talk about. Uh, we were climbing a mountain in Ecuador as part of a week-long race. Our, lead, our team was in the lead. Uh, we had Discovery Channel film crew following us up the hill 
there's a rule for people in the team they have to stay within 100 meters stay together or you're disqualified and i was struggling to stay be, um, in, in touch with my three teammates they were climbing ahead they were getting like 100 meters of, uh, in, in front of me and i was having a bad day i was bonking what we call bonking running out of energy and i was risking the team there by not doing certain things first of all i should have asked for help why wasn't i asking for help because a help is when i give my pack to some other team member to carry so they're carrying two packs and i'm carrying no pack and i get a tow with a little bungee cord and how's that going to look on tv worldwide discovery channel and my ego was stopping me asking for help and that's one of the four pillars of of a champion team is that there is no ego you leave it at home or get rid of it totally number two i wasn't communicating i wasn't asking for help and uh so there's two two more pillars so the first one is getting your teammates that align with their values number two is um asking for help and putting on putting your ego apart or leaving your ego at home so the fourth pillar i want to talk about is uh is trust so <laughs> I, there's a good story here but i haven't got time to tell the full story i'll tell um okay one of these races we're getting some really bad chafing on our butt cheeks and uh they got wet in the kayaking stage and they were rubbing together and so we had to tape duct tape on on the butt on the two butt cheeks to stop them rubbing of our teammates now that's a very personal thing after day three or four it's not very hygienic down there but we had to um just put aside uh modesty and ask our teammates to help each other there's there's more personal stories this, uh, and then this i want to tell you about leeches and the places they got and the, the the amount of trust we need to have in each other uh to sort this problem out so we can work together as a team so the metaphor for that is in a team situation in, in a business sense there's a lot of stuff going on in a personal way that we may not know about stuff at home that's preventing that person performing as a team at work temporarily and how much trust we need for a champion team to be a champion team by sharing with our teammates and taking a bit of a workload for now like getting the toe up the mountain temporarily or taking some of that load for that person who's having problems at home and that's a trust thing you know it might be family health marriage whatever that you need to trust your teammates with so that we can work as a team as i said i haven't got time to dive deep on this but those are the four pillars of a champion team we've found from sport is one is aligning with the value values two is leaving your ego at home uh, three is communication and four is trust so i want to work on the fourth of four of the six topics i want to talk about and we find in the research that winners are superbly organized absolutely every detail covered off so you can set the goal as i said before they've made the, the the route or the pathway to that goal clear and part of that making it clear is being superbly organized and i as an athlete i do the six p's prior planning prevents piss poor performance and i know that, that sounds a bit negative with the piss poor performance in there so I, I change it to prior planning promotes pristine performance and what that looks like in reality is when i enter the race months before the race i'll start a list uh, of all the things that could possibly go wrong in my sport and i'll type up a, a column of all those things that could go wrong and it's on my computer and so there's probably four pages of things like a mechanical like a puncture or the support crew vehicle running out of petrol or losing a shoe and in, in the transition area all these things that could get in the way putting a hole in my kayak so beside that column i'll have a cure which is like the ambulance at the bottom of the cliff like putting a hole in the kayak duct tape that's it's too late you've put the hole in you had to pull over to the side of the river patch it up there's half an hour lost even more powerful is the fence at the top of the cliff which is the prevention and so it'll be like buying a stronger kayak made out of kevlar getting the skills to avoid rocks in the first place um, and then the fourth column will be is there any opportunity for invention here or innovation but the point I want to work on, work on work on most is those first three columns is identifying the issues not focusing on them uh but acknowledging them and finding a way to to, to pre prevent that happen and there's a saying around this that says um the harder i work the luckier i get you know in other words there's no such thing as luck you make your own luck and this is this is one of the the, the keys uh of the research shows of successful people who get their goals regularly is that they're very pedantic on their planning 
And of course, that includes a training program as well. So moving on to the fifth point of those six is innovation. So this is that fourth column I was just talking about previously. Where is there an opportunity for uh, to do something cunning or clever? And I... <laughs> Yeah, I, I cast my mind back to engineering school. When I was in the design class there, we were designing engines and gearboxes and those sorts of things. And the design tutor was very clear right from the start. Right from the start he'd say, remember people, there is always more than one right answer. And that's stood me very well in terms of creativity and being an inventive uh, and innovative in my racing. And I'd take on the underdog perspective. The Sean Fitzpatrick used to do this. He'd, he'd train as if he was number two. So I'd, I'd design or prepare or race as if I was number two. Because if you're a number one and you get complacent, that's when you get knocked off your perch. If, you, if you're imagining, how would someone else do this? How would my competitors do this? How would someone who's determined to knock me off first place, how would they do this? And that, that leans, leads to, do, to new ways of training uh inventing new equipment new marketing campaigns that sort of stuff so um i wanted to, it became my brand if you like so i was that guy you know that guy who always came up with a new invention and that puts me one step ahead i'm always thinking ahead it's my reputation as being an innovator and this is right now is the time to do this in business how can you be acknowledged as that person, oh, you're that company, oh, you're that guy, oh, you're that girl that always does something different. You're thinking, you're a thinking person. You, oh, how can I compete with that? They're always one step ahead. And it's about how do you stand out and be different? And this is coming back to my second point I talked about is what's your unique ability? It's part of your branding. Uh, how are we going for time? Ooh, better hurry up. So the sixth point I want to talk about is losing your baggage. So in adventure racing, there are week, those races are kind of a week long, 24-7. You're going through the night having very little sleep, very, very, very little time to stop. And one of the key things there is to carry as little weight as you can. So there's a saying that says, if you want to travel far and fast, lose your baggage. And that's, a, that's about emotional baggage, which is another thing I want to talk about. That, that's my seventh point. We don't really have time to, today to talk about that unless it comes up in questions. It's about how do you lose your emo emotional baggage, like limiting beliefs, etc. But in a physical sense, how do you lose the, that extra weight you don't need to carry in these adventure races? Because there's mandatory kit, like the first aid kit, the warm clothing, the food, all the compass and the map and the emergency locator beacons. How do we make all that stuff as light as we can? First of all, you buy light stuff, quality. My taste is simple. The best never fails to satisfy. So you want to buy the lightweight stuff. Then you set about light, making it, that stuff lighter. Like, for example, chopping off the, the labels. You know, when they soak up a bit of sweat or rain, they weigh a few extra grams. Uh, any zipper pullers, we, you know, the zipper puller is a metal piece. You replace that with a little bit of string. And this may sound very pedantic and subtle. And it is. You know, one zipper puller ain't going to win us the race, a label off your shirt ain't going to win you, win you the race, but it's the combination of all those things that add up to eight or 900 grams, maybe even a kilogram per person you don't have to carry through the race. But more important than that is the psychology, knowing that you've done everything you can, a bit like the six Ps, you know, I've gone through and done every little thing that I can to enhance my chance of winning or success at my goal. Plus, it also is part of the branding. When people see you've gone to this length of chopping off every little thing, it's a psych out factor. You know, when they see our packs in the, at the start are much smaller than theirs and there's only five minutes to start, they go, oh, man, how was, you know, they've handicapped themselves by not doing that attention to detail. So it's a, it's a ruthless thing. And in business, you know, we've got post-COVID, you need to be truly competitive. Are you being truly competitive or are you carrying holding on to crap you don't need to carry from the past? That isn't actually relative relevant anymore. And if, if you're going to win the race, I mean, if you're going to survive the race in business post-COVID, let alone win it, you've got to absolutely be ruthless. You're no, you're no help to anyone else if you're running at a loss. So there you are. There's my six points. Um, I'll just summarize those goals. What do winners do that's different? Uh, Capitalise on the unique ability. Thirdly, what makes a champion team? Fourthly, they're superbly organized. Fifth, they're open to innovation. There's always more than one right answer. How do you be different and make that, uh, have that as your brand? 
and fourthly, uh, cutting off the, ruthlessly cutting off the stuff you don't need to, to need to carry. So I'm going to throw the the rest of the time open to questions now, questions and answers. Okay, thank you for that, Steve. Oof. <laughs> can I have a moment to catch up? Um, if no, no, no. Fast oh, you talk, I can see why you have won so many races. Um, you talked about ego, and there's a saying that says ego is about who is right, and truth is about what is right. And I think that fits in very well with your. Um, your, your statement just before. Um, look, we've had a lot of questions coming in. Some of them are coming in via email. Some, some of them are coming in on the uh, on the screen here. But here's one that I think a lot of business owners listening in on this will recognise, and it comes from Jeff from Lower Hut. Frankly, I feel exhausted from the stress of managing my business through a very difficult year. Steve, how do you refresh from exhaustion when the race event is still going? Now, I guess he's saying that uh, in business, there is no finish line. It's relentless. In a race, even an endurance race, seven days, 10 days, you do have a finish line. What sort of advice can you give to Jeff? Yep, it's a good question, and it's a tricky one. And I think that you've, yeah, Jamie, you've hit it on the mark. There is no finish line. And so to me, you know, if we're continuing with the sporting adventure racing metaphor, I think it's important that, he creates finish lines, many finish lines, and builds in that recovery. We know as athletes, when we're training for an event, you do the hard session, a hard training session, you need to have time, three or four days, for the body to rebuild and become stronger to capitalize on that hard session. Otherwise, you're just going to end up uh, training and having a breakdown, uh, you know, physical injury. So I would suggest that, is it Jeff that asked the question yeah. that yeah. it's that he creates uh, breaks and, you know, uh, we talked about this earlier, Jamie, um, perhaps booking a uh, weekend away, you know, so go and buy the airfare, put it in your diary and say that's non-negotiable and be able to delegate. And I think that could be another part of it. You know, in our team situation, um, we have times when someone, the navigator, is too tired to navigate properly and we need to hand the map over to someone else, map and compass to someone else while the navigator has a bit of a break and goes to the back of the team and just sort of, has a bit of a, um, it gives his brain a rest while someone else is doing the hard work. And I, I suspect that's probably what Jeff would be good to do is, is trust someone else. Maybe, I don't know, is there someone in the team? If not, then get on a mentor or a, a board of directors or someone who can take over for a week or so while you have that break. Um, it's also about planning, isn't it? So take the time out, turn the phone off, don't answer the calls while you take time to sharpen the saw, as Stephen Covey would say, the seven habits of highly effective people. You need to take time out to sharpen the saw. And I think Jeff's running the chance, uh, running the risk of being dull and blunt if he doesn't take the time to, to recover. That, that's a very telling response. Thanks, Steve. Um, now, just a reminder that all the questions that are coming through, I, we've got so many questions that they will not be all answered by Steve in the next half hour or so but they are all on record and they will be shared with Steve and he will come back to you one-on-one uh, -on -one after the event over the next couple of days and answer some of these questions. Now, I've got another one um, from Russell in Fongaray. Some people claim that their brain functions better when they are fighting fit. Is there any scientific evidence to support this assumption? Yep, I uh, think Simon. Uh uh this is in the subject of resilience uh or mental health actually the science uh, and the research is very clear there's a lot of it out there to say that you do work way better when you're fit physically fit uh your brain works way better uh, so let me share an example i've done some racing uh aaron slight motorcycle racer he, he did a, a, a tv type event with us that was based on um you know, some fitness activities and you know you, he's a motorcycle racer i've also done uh, co co being co-driver in the Rally of New Zealand. This is this um, with Dave Strong. So this is you know a week long of, of rally driving, racing through the length of New Zealand. And what I've noticed about these motorsport racers, this is just an example, is they all are superbly fit. They get out, bike, run, swim, kayak. And Aaron, for example, he he would have beaten most triathletes because he was so fit because he needed to do that to keep his brain alert for the time on the motorbike racing circuit. And uh, 
So that's that's kind of supporting the research, which is very clear on you need a healthy lifestyle to have your brain working efficiently. And part of that is just the basics, which we so often try and find excuses around nowadays. Is it's just simple bit of exercise every day, uh, eating well and sleeping well. And how often do we get uh, seduced away by the, the junk food and the convenience food when we know we know in the heart of hearts that food out of the garden, uh, fresh stuff and food is best for us but food in a packet is crap and that's all part of having the mental clarity we don't want all this this junk circulating around in our circulation and that goes with fitness as well we know that a certain level of fitness is uh, is, is way better for your uh, mental clarity does it answer that question yeah. it's just common sense really i think sorry but it's about eating eating dirt yes what are you going to do jamie at the end we've got 10 to give away and uh, so they're just going to be randomly selected, selected uh, out of the audience. And then uh, we'll come back to you via email and ask you for your postal address. And they'll be sent out. This is one that you gave to me um, a couple of years ago. And I won't read it out because you stroked my ego by putting a personal message on it. But having just type, said that ego is about who's right and truth is about what's right, I won't read it out because um, you knew exactly what to do to make me perk, to perk myself up. So thank you, Steve. So we'll have that draw later on and we'll let everyone know. Um, now, here's another question um, from Hunter. The two older mentors you had during your peak racing years were neuro-linguistic NLP trained. Did their help make a difference? And if so, how? What do you like about some of the NLP techniques and how would they cross over to business? Okay, so I just need to clarify that. Yes, I had Graham and Dorian Felton. Graham has passed on now uh, three years ago, I think it was, at the age of 96. He was, I called him Yoda. He's quite, he was shorter than me and he was very wrinkly and but very wise like Yoda. And he and his, his, his wife, Doreen, uh, just had good common sense uh, motivation, uh, organization stuff. It's about having your life in order, you know, having, being prepared and planned and that sort of stuff, which is good basic common sense, very similar to NLP, but it wasn't actually NLP. Parallel to that, I also had uh, I was run, I was training in the in the field of NLP myself, and I had another guy, Richard Bolstad. And he's a, he's a an expert in, in this sort of stuff, and I'd go and consult with him. And Brian Royd's another consultant as well. So um, it was in parallel, but Graham and Dorian weren't NLP. But the bottom line is that, as I said at the start of my presentation, I'm not naturally talented as physically talented as an athlete. It comes from here, and I think whatever system you use mental clarity is the most important thing and 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 tapping into that intrinsic motivation i talked about how did the goals and and how you spend your day how does that support your purpose on this planet you know will you be disappointed at the end of this phase you're going through if you're not doing those sorts of things and this is where the nlp and that sort of stuff is is critically important whatever motivation system you use Okay, Steve, you ready for another question? Um, yep. By the way, uh, this webinar is being recorded, and later on today we will send out a link so that you can watch this uh, webinar, uh, replay the webinar at your leisure. Um, but please hang in there. Don't just disappear now because you're going to get a recording. Um, well, no one ever actually watches the uh, recording, I found out. You sorry? think, oh, that's a good idea, and it sits there in your inbox, and you never actually do it. So. Yeah. Hang on one yeah. from Craig. When was the last time you did something for the first time? Oh, cool. Right now. <laughs> I'm, I'm, a, I'm, I'm retired from racing, um, although I can't help it. I, you know, I'll do the peak to peak and that sort of stuff as a, a as a veteran. But um, no, a bit, bit broken to, to win races. And so I've, I've taken on an interest in blue water sailing. So I've been... Uh, racing my trailer yacht for the last five or six years and um, my next step up is i've been I'm watching all these youtube videos uh about people who are doing sailing the mediterranean around the world caribbean whatever so um yeah i'm trying something new it's good though you can still be competitive but on a sailboat um now you you do you mentioned before you talk to uh um young adults kids whatever and here's a question from graham how best do we install confidence in teenagers to become entrepreneurial while accepting the knockbacks that inevitably will happen 
that's not really my area of expertise, but it might I might be a challenge for you, Steve. <laughs> what was that? I thought it would be a challenge for you. <laughs> so, yeah, the, the bottom line here really is confidence, isn't it? Or self belief. And that this is a universal, uh, a human challenge. And it's something that I've really struggled with. Um, that's what I wrote my other book, Lucky Legs, about is, is how did I how deal with what, uh, what what was driving me? You know, what was driving me to win? Why did I need to win? And that um, led to a bigger question, what's the answer to the meaning of life? <laughs> Which is a much bigger question. And I think underneath it all, you know, humans really want to feel that they – uh, they're, they're, one of, they're always in a struggle for confidence. I know there's some people out there who have ego, and I used to be one of those people who had too much ego. And um, I think taking it back to the question of these teenagers, we need to teach them how to have confidence in the area that they are truly passionate about. So remember I talked about number two point was finding your unique ability. So I'd encourage those teenagers to set a little goal, a small goal, achievable goal, in an area that they're really good at, uh, pick a project, do something, and follow that through, and then use that as an example for bigger, more important, perhaps. Well, no, not, not necessarily more important, but bigger goals. So, does that answer that question? So, I think it's about showing them the way. It's also about being good role models or identifying other role models who have succeeded in that area they want to and copy that process. Um, here's a question from Nicole. Best advice for an upcoming... Yeah, can I just say, Keith Sorry. has said, confidence comes from success. Success comes from falling or failing and getting up again. And that's a good point, Keith. Thanks. Uh, and that's what I alluded to earlier. took me five attempts to win the Coast to Coast. At, but the research shows successful people don't see failure as failure. And this is, I think, something we really need to drum into our young people is that failure is just feedback. It's just ideas on how not to do it. Good that you tried it. And it's the same with innovation. If we're going to try and do something different in business, in this new new post-COVID world, we have to be prepared for this, the failures as well, learn from that, and then try something different. And the the, the history books are full of people. Edison, for example, who had 9,900, whatever it is, he had multiple attempts at getting the light bulb until he finally found one way that it worked. And so failure, you just need to reframe it and not get dejected by failure, but use it to step on top of that and step up to the next attempt. Sorry to interrupt, Jamie. I, I think that was uh, worthwhile hearing. Um, a very short question from Nicole. Best advice for an upcoming 70.3 first time a race. Now, I'm assuming that that person is either 70.3 years old or 73 <laughs> years old. Uh, and I'm well, not sure whether it's a running race or whatever, but it's if it's the first race at that age, it's, it's wonderful. What's oh, the advice? Well, What's the well, advice first time? For doing a 7.3? Placing on an event. Uh, I'm, I didn't really get the question properly, but... You want to wait 30 years until you get there yourself? <laughs> somebody who's looking as though they are doing an upcoming race for the first time uh, at 70 years of age. Age. A bit hard to answer on the fly like that, isn't it? Oh, well, the first thing is uh, do it gradually. Don't jump in too quickly. You get injured. injured. Um, I think the thing is to get some uh, a very progressive training schedule. Um, I'm not sure on the semi, I think it's a triathlon, isn't it, with swim in it. But one of the things I'm very big on with coast to coast and adventure racing is skills are really important. Um, for example, bunch riding skills, I don't think you have that in a 70.3. Rock running skills, it's different than road running. So you need to get specific at it. So my advice to that athlete would be to figure out what are the specific skills they need and start working on those rather than doing general fitness. I mean, your cross training is good for uh, allowing recovery, but. Um, I wouldn't jump in too quick and get injured or uh, if, if, if it's a first time and you haven't done this sort of thing before, just a gradual build up, you know, allow a year to get fit for that specific stuff. If they're already fit, then uh, that's fine. Just one of the things with the training for a long distance event is you need to separate out the intensity from the duration. So build in a, a clever training schedule that shows you at least 100% of the duration they're going to be out there for the day. So the weekend might be a long low level, low intensity, uh, long, slow distance session. And then later in the week, um, you'll show your body the intensity and, and, the, and the strength and the power that it's going to need in a shorter session so that none of, the, none of those two concepts comes together until race day. Um, I've seen um, here's one from Rangi and Timaru. 
when you are engaged by a business to motivate management uh, to motivate management and staff, this is you being engaged, what weight do you put on a company having a mission or value statement? Now, you sort of covered this before. What value and weight do you put on a company having a mission or value statement? Yep, right. So we talked about this earlier. So you know, remember I said, you know, I've got this up on the wall in the office at the reception. That this is our mission statement as a company. And just to recap, I, I said, you know, that, that, you've got to be careful that's not cliched and just put up there once and never seen again. It's, it's about this is this is this is the measure you live your 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 life by as a company daily. Refer to this: Are we on track? Are we being guided by this value set? It's not just something about providing quality customer service, blah blah blah. It's more than that. It's got to be really deep and meaningful and, and coming from here. It's, it's the the heart and soul of the company. That mission statement is only good if it's actually put into practice and used on a daily basis. So. And, and, and as I said, employing people, the team needs to be uh, made up of people who 100% agree with that. Otherwise, you're you're um, uh, you're going to have disagreement and disharmony, and you haven't got that synergy uh, in in the business. People aren't, you know, the synergy is where the sum of the parts, and some of the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. So, Steve, you walk into a business and there's nothing on the wall, and you start talking about a mission and a vision statement. Where does that come from? Does it is it coming from the owner? Is it coming from the directors? Is it coming from the employees? If you had nothing, where would you start it from? Yeah, uh, I think it's really important to. I'm I'm not a business expert, but I'm trying to create a, a team metaphor here. You know, how do we do this in sport? So you don't have to have a thing on the wall. That's that is often just lip service. What really matters is it a living document? Is it a living philosophy? Is is the team um, totally ga engaged in this, and, and does it re is it reflected in all the emails and all the correspondence and all the communication, all the marketing? Is it reflected in, in every aspect of the team? And so that's about communication, isn't it? Communication within the team members, but also communication in terms of your branding, in terms of what do other people see that business being. So another way to do this is to look from the outside. How does someone on the outside? How do our customers see us? How does our, how do our competitors see us? Uh, how does the world look into that? Can they recognize this philosophy that we're talking about? So it's a, it's a living thing. Does that make sense? In a team situation, when we're in venture racing, you know, you can feel the energy. You can see the energy. You look at team, for example, Team Seagate, you know, the adventure racing New Zealand team that just smashes the in, these international races. You can see it. They've got this energy about them. You can see it in the spark in their eyes when they're being interviewed. You can see it in the in the stuff that, you, that ends up on social media. You can see that they've got this team momentum, if you like, and that's what we're talking about with a uh, – a mission statement for the for the company. It's not just a piece of paper. It's actually how they live, the, or how the team exists. Right. Thanks, Steve. Now, a question in from Jenny: How do you get someone who has gone off the boil with regards to your goals back on track? So you've had goals, gone off the boil. How do you how to reinvigorate and get back on track? Okay. So obviously, the goal wasn't a truly. Um, uh, intrinsic goal it wasn't con uh, connected or linked to their uh, their purpose on the planet, and so that's what I do is I'll go back and ask them, well, how does this support your real purpose for being? And and if you were a ninety five year old, or you know, if you're a great grandmother or grandfather, looking back at that, what advice would you give the younger you? Um, another thing I have is there's a little mnemonic from the new mon uh, from the NLP world. Is it's a kind of a checklist checking is your goal. Uh, taking off all of these things my uh, my version of it is improve it so first of all is is the goal i inspirational is it measurable is it positively stated is it on paper or do you share it um oh what are your resources that's the r um va you know improve v a k o g we talked about that what sense is visual auditory kinesthetic uh let you know that you're on track for your goal another one is the ecology this could be another reason why that person has failed is because then what what are you prepared to give up to to or is there anything that you're not prepared to give up to get that goal? For example, uh, working with y young kids in school, they want to make the All Blacks, you know. Um, and so I just check with them, well, you're going to obviously need to, at some stage, leave your hometown. If you're living in Gore or somewhere down south, you probably need to move to Auckland. Is that okay if you're going to lose contact with your friends and family in Gore? You know, and that's an ecology check, uh, as an example. And, and, I, and 
the last two was initiated by self and time based. So you have you put a time limit on when when do I want to have this goal by, and, and uh, th so that's the sort of mnemonic I'd, I'd check through. It's a checklist, and one of those things will probably highlight uh, why that person's gone off the boil because one of those things aren't working. Okay, uh, I mean, I just skimmed really briefly across that one. That's the sort of thing I probably need to come in and do a consultation with to, to, to check that one. But uh, or I could email that, I suppose. Yeah. Okay. Um, here's a challenging one from David. Excellent in business as in sport is a 24 seven 365 exercise. How do you recommend keeping yourself and your team engaged and focused on something that never ends? So it's a lifestyle thing, isn't it? Um, some, the, the, yeah, that's a pretty open question. Uh, <laughs> can you be more specific? You know, give us an example. Uh, are you talking about business? Are you talking about sport? Are you talking about personal life? What is it? I mean, life is something that never ends. So that's a great metaphor. You know, how do how do pe people succeed in having a long and successful and happy life? Or happy actually is a bit of a contentious issue at the moment, but a, a meaningful life. Uh, what sort of what sort of thing? You're winging it, aren't you? <laughs> hey? You're winging it. But it's good. It's a challenging question. Well, the question's not clear. That's the trouble. Um, what is the question? Uh, winging it, but or, or should we move on? Sorry. What's the question? Well, how do you continue? How can it's a little bit like we covered before? How do you continually motivate when there's no finish line? Uh, and it's something that never ends. In, in your events, you've always had a finish line. You've always envisaged yourself being first to cross the line. You've got five days in the jungle. You've got uh, 12 hours to cross the uh, from the east, uh, west coast to the east coast of the South Island. But uh, in business, it's never ending. It's a grind after grind after grind. Yeah, so it's the same question we have to start. That question. Yeah, it's about creating finish lines, isn't it? And and. I think that's that's we've already answered that question in a way. I think that's we can move on to a better question if that's all right. Um, has every member of the team internalized the true team values and can they articulate it in their own terms? Has every member of the team internalized the true team values and can they articulate it in their own terms? It's coming from Keith. Ooh, has every member of the team internalized the truth? You might want to take time and answer that via email. I think, yeah, that's a good question. It's a big one. Uh, uh, my short answer to that, Keith, is if you're, w when you're recruiting, whether it be for a sports team or a business team, it's important to get to this nitty gritty question in the in the job interview process or in the team interview process and check that, you're filtering for those people that truly understand what your values are. And, and of course, that throws back to the, um, to the business management or the team organizer is to be able to clearly articulate that in the first place to, to see, you know, so you've got a measure to check uh, are these applicants lining up with that or not. So you need to, it's good, all about clear communication. Um, and that probably helps answer the next one. What approach or tools to refocus the team mid-race or during general business with things are not going well? Mm. I'm just going to go back to Keith's question about internalizing, you know, your team members. It's about being honest, isn't it? Honest, isn't it? It's about being brutally honest and not trying to put some pretend thing there, you know, not trying to create something that's not really you. It's about authenticity. And you know how much easier it is when someone's being authentic. And we need more of this truth and authenticity and stuff. So what was the question, the new question? Um, there's somebody coming in. I lost that one. But i tell you a, a true life one that came in yesterday. I had a call from a, um, a, uh, a client who had a phone call from their bank manager and said, can you come and see me on Thursday? You have run out of money. And uh, this chap asked me, what sort of exercises, he said, his stomach was churning and his head was throbbing. What sort of physical exercises, what can he do to relieve the, the stress over the next few days before he goes to see his bank manager? So he's, he's partly asking, I need some maybe some financial advice, but I also need some physical and mental stimulus to get me through the next few days. What would you recommend to him? 
so he's nervous. Um, so one thing is, um, like I said just a few minutes ago, seconds ago, authenticity. So there's no point in bullshitting to someone, you know, whether it be your boss or your bank manager or your team um, manager or your whoever. I think it's just front up with the absolute truth and people respect that, you know. And I'm trying to be authentic and truthful now where, you know, I'm just – it's about uh, being prepared to be vulnerable. And Brene Brown talks a lot about this, by the way. If you want to look up vulnerability, look up Brene Brown's uh, TED Talks. So vulnerability is where the key is, I think, is that then you can make progress from there. If you're trying to hold up something that's unsustainable, like if this guy has run out of money, and, and, and then just be honest with the bank manager and work together as a team rather than trying to uh, prove yourself to someone with something that's not actually true. So that's the first part is, is to calm your mind down and that nervousness once you've accepted oh, i'm just going to be honest lay it all out be in my soul then that's where you can make true progress and your, your mind will calm down physically yeah it's just it's the basics again it's, and and we just got to get back to basics good food, good nutrition drink enough get some um, exercise a bit of exercise walking's amazing go for a, you know a good long walk and when you get to that it puts you in, the, in a good state of mind a zone that enables you to problem solve. And so I think walking every day is great. Or walking with a mate who you can bounce ideas off. Some, you know, it's the new golf. You know, people people have business meetings with golf. Well, actually walking and biking, you know, at a low intensity. Or I'm not talking about biking hard up a hill. We're just talking about going for a cruise. That's where your mind clears and you can start to make some progress. Um, Winton sent in the question about the media. Uh, not quite sure whether this is you or not, but the media feed us a staggering amount of good and bad news to point to the point that some people are nearly overwhelmed by it all. It seems ignorant to ignore it all, but it must affect people's well-being. Now, I think he's talking about all types of media, uh, public media, social media, the works, and I think we all get overwhelmed by it. In NLP, how, how do you recommend that that gets handled? Well, first of all, is to recognize fact from meaning. So separating out, you know, like, like a, a, even if we, we used to think of the news as fact, you know, you turn, tune into the six o'clock news and uh, uh, and someone will be presenting you the facts, but it's actually someone's interpretation of the facts or it's in a certain context, you know, COVID context, you know, doom and gloom, blah, blah. So I think it's this is the bottom line that you'll learn from any mindfulness practice, whether it be NLP, spirituality, yoga, whatever, is, is to how to separate out someone else's meaning or your meaning that you've added to what's actually happened and just state the concrete, concrete facts. You know, yep, okay, someone caught a virus and that virus is contagious and don't add all this doom and gloom about business to it um, if it's going to, you know, if, if it's not factual. And I think that's the probably the bottom line is there is to to take a step back and get a perspective on this thing that that bit of news or this media, and think you know just looking at it from a you know a helicopter perspective or from a distant whatever works for you to get perspective on it and separate out the meaning. Um, and I think we yeah you've got to recognise that a lot of advertising stuff it's all marketing someone's trying to t sell us something so recognize look below the surface and say what are they trying to sell us here and what is actually happening and this is what you know people are criticizing facebook and social media for because it's so much crap and um, people's judgment added to it and i think we need to separate that out and perhaps like you know i've, I've stopped doing my Facebook and social media so much because it's not helpful sometimes. You're thinking, you know, people only ever paste on Facebook, their A-game, and you don't see the negative or the bad stuff that they're challenged with. And um, just get back to meeting people face-to-face, -face, um, reading meaningful books, uh, and someone I noticed talking about here, mindfulness, Nicole, and that's that's essentially it, is, is, is getting back to... Uh, a peaceful state of mind and the breathing you know that sort of stuff uh, those sorts of uh, breathing exercises breathing classes you go to to get you out of the fight or flight state of mind that we tend to get into especially with covid uh, we need to uh, to to calm our our system we're not running away from lions you know it's 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 a virus but we um it's not something we need to panic about and, and we're too often 
in an adrenal state or a, um, a state that's reacting to panic when it's not actually panic. Does that make make any sense? Does that answer that question? It's, it's just my opinion. Okay, so I might I'm not the expert on that. <laughs> Steve, look, we're coming to the end of an hour, uh, and I think you've, you've handled some very curly questions uh, very, very well uh, um, because you've answered them on the fly. Uh, some of them you knew that were coming in, but many of them were fresh and just thrown at you, and you're not a, you're not, you don't pretend to be a great philosopher. All you can do is share your own personal experiences and, and try and translate that in, in sport. It's like this, and it's not a lot different to business. Um, because you have the challenges, you have competitors, you have things that don't go right, you're always having things that, that are coming out of left field. How do you keep your mind and soul and heart together all at once? So, Steve, maybe just for the last two or three minutes, just give us a wrap-up, and we'll remind everyone that uh, there's 10 of these to give away. We'll just go through and random, randomly select uh, entries, and uh, they'll be posted out to you. So, Steve, just take the last two or three minutes Go for it, and then we'll close for the day. So I just want to cap, just continue on the, the note you just made. Is I, I I'm a professional conference speaker, motivational type speaker. And the the reason people ask me to come and speak is because I've I've learned a lot about winning against the odds, sort of thing. But also I've I've suffered quite badly from depression, and I've had a lot of help with that. And so I get asked to talk a lot on mental health as well. So I'm just sharing what I've learned from the study, from the counseling, from the reading and the research I've done. Uh, I'm, you know, I'm 50, 57 years old now. I've had a good look at life. So it's not that I've, I'm necessarily trained to PhD level or anything like that, but I'm, it's more like EQ versus IQ, you know, in a practical sense, how do you apply this? And so sport is a good metaphor for that. So that's the context I'm sharing this on. Um, so the, the key thing is it's about attitude, isn't it? It's about what we do up here. And to get uh, to get clarity on that, we need to understand what really drives us. What are we truly passionate about? How can we contribute to this world? How can I leave this place, a, this world, a better place for me, having lived on this planet and consumed like I do? How can I tread lightly, or how can I improve it? And it's about team as well. How can we make a champion team rather than a team of champions? Uh, that because no matter what endeavor we're in, whether it's like coast to coast, you think, oh, that's an individual win that Steve's had. No, it's not actually. I'm part of a team. I've got my support crew. I've got my sponsors. I've got my friends, family, whatever. So how can we be better humans and achieve better through that? And I think one of the bottom lines that's come through here is, is about authenticity. It's about being true to yourself and true to others. So uh, one final thing I want to finish on is I've done a lot of international racing. And New Zealand... It's a tiny country way down the bottom of the South Pacific. And as teams, we're often competing against these well-funded, fully sponsored American teams or European teams or Asian teams who've got all the money. It's all laid on. They've got all the latest and greatest gear. We Kiwis are often racing with substandard support, what we call substandard. But in actual fact, that is a huge advantage. And I think this is the case in New Zealand business. You know, we are competing on the world stage, but we have something more important than financial backing. We have true passion. We as a nation have huge pride as Kiwis. I'm getting emotional talking about this. And I'm sure you can sense that feeling if you tell your own story on this, how against the odds we can we can box above our weight, you know, and you look at Team New Zealand, use them. That's coming up as a great example. We're a tiny little country competing against, against all these other highly funded New Zealand, uh, 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 sorry, competing against all these other highly funded international world teams. Yet we have got that reputation. What does Team New Zealand represent to you? It's innovation. It's cunning. It's thinking. It's authenticity. It's about being competitive. Use them as a role model. So, Steve, that's it for the day, is it? Well, no. Employ me. <laughs> yes. As we said, you can email me some more questions. We can keep on going. If, if people are online, they want to keep asking questions, we'll keep doing it. Uh, just want to put a bit of a plug in there. Yeah, I am available as a consultant or a motivator to come into your business, whether that be online or whether that be in person. Yep. Okay, we'll just go back to this screen here, I think. Um, well, Steve, that has, and yes, there is a bit of an emotion in your voice, and it's translated to me now about 
our little tiny country here. We're, we're not really relevant to the rest of the world, but we're very relevant to ourselves. And, and that's what's important, our own relevancy in life. Uh, and it doesn't matter what the rest of the world thinks or needs to know about us. Um, Steve, that has been invigorating. Uh, it's been heartwarming. And I'm just looking at all the comments coming through and on the email, questions coming in. Um, we've got a lot to share after the webinar. Thank you from my heart. And I'm sure everyone here that's uh, been asking questions is thanking you as well. Um, Thank you everybody for your, your uh, signing in and, and being prepared to, to, to ask really good questions here. Thanks for your honesty. And putting a plug in, I do hope you get some engagements out of this. I know the brainstorm room is not there to, to uh, it's, it's, it's a, uh, a philosophic organization, um, not for profit, but you deserve some help and support and we'd love to have some clients come your way. So thank you, Steve. And there'll be a recording sent out or a link to this be sent out uh, by the end of the afternoon, along with the questions. And uh, so thanks, everybody, for dialing in. I've loved your comments. There's been some wonderful stuff there. Um, Steve, I hope to see you soon and uh, we'll catch up. Thank you, everyone, over and out.